How is scoliosis diagnosed? When patients are curious regarding whether they have scoliosis or not, a very common question is, how do I find out? What's the ultimate way of diagnosing whether a patient has scoliosis? Well, scoliosis, unfortunately, is a common problem. We know close to 7 million people alone in the U.S. actually live with scoliosis. And this doesn't include all the patients that are actually go undiagnosed, meaning they go undiagnosed into adult form, not knowing they actually have scoliosis. We do know scoliosis is most common most commonly diagnosed among school-aged children, typically during their growth cycle. There are many, many different types of scoliosis, but however, approximately 80% of all diagnosed cases are classified as something called idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis means there is no clear association to one single cause associated with scoliosis, meaning idiopathic scoliosis tends to be multifactorial. Most patients that are diagnosed with scoliosis are normally said, okay, idiopathic scoliosis is what they have. However, idiopathic scoliosis is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you have to exclude all other possibilities that could be associated with the causation of their scoliosis meaning the remaining 20% of cases that are not diagnosed as idiopathic scoliosis are normally, normally have known causes or are known associated things that could possibly be the causation. One most common one is something called neuromuscular scoliosis. And this is when you have a condition that affects the nerve system or spinal cord of the body or affects the muscular system of the body or connective tissue of the body. And typically, this can be associated to the causation. These are things like neurofibromatosis, something like Marfan syndrome, Ehlers Downer syndrome. These types of soft tissue neurological disorders can be associated with the causation. Now, unfortunately, these neuromuscular conditions have a very wide spectrum, meaning some of these patients with these conditions have very, very mild effects. They have no known, they don't have any relatively serious symptoms and maybe they develop scoliosis. However, other patients with these same syndromes could have very significant effects. It's kind of like autism. Some patients with autism, uh, they have a spectrum, meaning some of them have very slight autistic and they're very, they function normally in society and they have no problems. Other patients with autism have very, very severe dysfunction and they're very clearly have an autistic dysfunction. So therefore these neuromuscular muscular syndromes, even though you would have to exclude them, sometimes they're very difficult to diagnose or find in some patients because they don't have any clear outward symptoms of their neuromuscular condition. Another, another diagnosis of scoliosis or another causation is something called congenital scoliosis. And this is when a patient actually is born with a bone of the spine that doesn't form properly called a hemivertebra. This hemivertebra is a half bone and you're born like this. And this hemivertebra or triangle shaped vertebra that typically occurs in the spine will cause a curvature to occur right in that area because you'll be stacked in between a bunch of normal vertebras which are normally square or rectangular. You put a triangle between that, it will cause a curvature on that side. That is called congenital scoliosis. Degenerative scoliosis is when the spine has some unresolved misalignment of the spine and it causes to degenerate over time, normally diagnosed in the adult stage. Degenerative scoliosis normally is a result of degenerating discs, bone, ligaments, and muscles in a very specific area that's normally progressing in the adult stage, normally diagnosed in, in adult patients, normally women around 50 years of age or so. And then the last most common type is traumatic scoliosis. And this is when a patient receives a trauma to the spine, which causes the scoliosis to occur as a result of that trauma. And it's a significant trauma leading to a significant scoliosis. Now, scoliosis can affect all ages, like I mentioned. However, it's most likely diagnosed between adolescents, meaning between 10 and 18 years of age. This is where somebody's diagnosed with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. But it can affect infants, totally elderly, and everybody in between. Idiopathic scoliosis and degenerative scoliosis are the two most common types of scoliosis to affect adults. Idiopathic scoliosis is just an extension of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis that did not get treated or was undiagnosed, and now you're finding it in the adult form, or some type of unresolved trauma leading to degenerated um, areas of the spine, which lead to a curvature developing. Now, unfortunately, a lot of patients are told that the, degener the degeneration that's occurring, their spine that's causing through their scoliosis, is something that's natural, and it's age-related, and there's nothing you can do about it. That is completely untrue. 
there is no such thing as natural, normal degeneration of the spine. Because when you look at this, what you find is that patients where the scoliosis is has a severe amount of degeneration and the rest of their spine has none. If it was related to age alone, the entire spine would be degenerating exactly at the same rate. It's kind of like an unaligned car. If a car is not aligned properly, one tire will degenerate or wear out faster than the other three. It's aging faster. So it, I would say it's an accelerated natural aging process to the spine, but it's not occurring at its normal and natural rate. What are the really the earliest signs of scoliosis in terms of finding out if you have, if you have it? The most common initial diagnosis of a potential patient having scoliosis in adolescent is postural, meaning the most common thing we see in, in kids is some type of posture problem. It's uneven shoulders, uneven hips, uneven waist, some type of rib deformity or rib, rib, rib arching. Something is wrong with their posture. Most kids have no pain when it comes to scoliosis. They don't have any outward symptoms. They don't feel any pain. They don't have any dysfunction. They can still exercise. They can still perform sports. They can still study. They can still do all the things that other kids tend to do. Normally, it's postural. And since it's happening, since when kids are going through their growth spurt and they're going through their life changes, a lot of times they're growing so quickly and so fast, they're not, they're, their parents are not paying close attention because they're kind of going through their, their, their growth phase. A lot of times they, they, they get missed. It gets missed. And if these growth changes occur after typical scoliosis screenings, they get missed as well. And if it happens during a point where they don't go to a, a pediatric visit, they can get they can progress relatively quickly and fast during this progressive stage. And normally posture is the number one sign. In adults, the number one sign tends to be pain. It's not posture, it's pain, because as the spine progresses in the, in the adult stage, it's progressing slowly as a result of gravity. And this slow compression is compressing nerves and tissues and, and muscles around that, that area. And this compression now causes pain. In children, they're elongating, they're growing. So it's not pain related. In adults, they're compressing, so it tends to hurt. In order for there to be di a diagnosis of scoliosis, you have to actually see a unnatural curvature of the spine. And the most definitive way of di diagnosing scoliosis is with an image. Most common is going to be an x-ray that actually looks at the spine. The best x-ray to take in is an x-ray that looks at the entire spine of the body from skull to pelvis. And you're looking at the, the, in all the segments and you're measuring something called a Cobb angle. This Cobb angle measurement is actually determining the size of your scoliosis. Now, normally scoliosis is diagnosed at a Cobb angle of 10 degrees or greater. Once you have 10 degrees or greater, you're diagnosed with a condition of scoliosis and there must be a rotational component, meaning the spine must have a turn associated with it or a twist. This makes this a three-dimensional problem, not just a two-dimensional issue. So again, normally it's gonna be a scoliosis X-ray that was taken. It's, they're measuring a Cobb angle. They're looking for a measurement of 10 degrees or greater with rotation. That means you would have scoliosis. Now, scoliosis is very often diagnosed into more subcategories, meaning to help further classify exactly the severity, the location, and also the type of curvature that you can have to help us determine effective treatment plans to best help that patient with scoliosis. So part of the diagnosis process is to further classify it based upon any other conditions like neuromuscular scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, you know, the traumatic scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, and also specific important patient or condition variables that can be associated, meaning the, how old the patient is, whether it's an adolescent scoliosis, whether it's infantile scoliosis, whether it's adult scoliosis, um, whether the, where the curve is located, whether it's a thoracic loaded scoliosis, a thoracolumbar, a lumbar scoliosis, and of course, whether it's a mild, moderate, or severe scoliosis in terms of size. Now, let me talk about the classification in terms of severity. The severity in terms of mild, moderate, or severe, I actually don't like this classification system because this classification system is used in order to classify if patients qualify for the treatment option of surgery. So when somebody's told they have a mild scoliosis, a curve that's 25 degrees or less, they're saying the curve is too mild 
that you don't, you doesn't warrant scoliosis surgery or fusion, which involves rods and screws in the spine and is very invasive. But mild scoliosis doesn't mean it's not going to become a potential problem and cause pain as the adult. Doesn't mean it's not going to cause posture deformations and other issues. All it's saying is the curve isn't big enough to have surgery. So I don't like using that word mild because it insinuates to patients that not to worry about it. And unfortunately, every severe scoliosis at one point was mild. So untreating or not taking mild scoliosis seriously is what leads to more severe scoliosis cases. So therefore, that's why I don't like the, the, the classification regarding severity, because it gives people a false sense of it's not a big deal when any deviation of the spine potentially can lead to issues as patients go through their aging process. So knowing the condition's early signs, meaning posture as a child or pain as an adult can lead to early detection. We definitely know the rule of scoliosis is that smaller curves are easier to treat than bigger curves. And as patients get older, they're more difficult to treat than when they're younger. So therefore, being proactive and treating scoliosis in its smallest possible form leads to the best chance of success. At Scoliosis Reduction Center, we definitely offer proactive treatments. We encourage patients to treat scoliosis early in life and not let curves become bigger and allow patients to become older with more severe conditions, which is typically the traditional approach is to not to worry about scoliosis until it becomes severe enough to where you now need to consider surgery. Of course, if you can prevent any type of invasive surgery, that would be the, 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 the best approach. But since the only treatment model they have to reduce scoliosis is invasive surgery, most traditional approaches or nutritional doctors say, just don't worry about it. I completely disagree. I think being proactive regarding treatment offers the best outcome and the best chance of success over your entire life. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.